everyone, and welcome to Live Academy, the virtual design learning platform by Neil Middle East Architecture Lab. My name is Riyad Jukka. I'm joining from Dubai, and I'll be moderating today's lecture by Chris Brecht of Studio Brecht. And today we will also start the second semester of Live Academy. So if you've joined us before, welcome back. And if you've just joined us for the first time, then a very special welcome to you. And I'd like to speak a bit more about our program just to inform the people that haven't joined before. Live Academy was born as a lockdown project, which we created in the past month through our research platform, Neil. The program is aimed at decentralizing access to contemporary design education. And in semester two and throughout the month of July, we will have a series of lectures by prominent contemporary architects, as well as classes on software by experts from all over the world. I urge you to take a look at our roster from this month and to register to as many sessions as your schedule allows. If you've missed a lecture, please feel free to subscribe and watch the recording on our channel on YouTube, which will be edited and recorded and put out for people to watch for a long period of time. And if you'd like to get access to the beginner class from the past semester, please visit liveacademy.tv and the host will post these links in the chat. So be mindful of that. Our lecture for today is very special, not only because of the beauty, simplicity, and radical ideas behind the works of Studio Precht, but also because Chris Brecht has carved his successful journey in a very unconventional way. The topic of his talk will revolve around the business of design or the design of business, and I'll leave Chris to expand on that. I think he also agrees that it's a topic that is very important, especially in light of the current times, but also important for anybody that is looking to start a business in architecture or design, and it's something that is often overlooked by architects. I've been following Chris's work for a number of years now, and very much uh, looking forward to as stark as I'm sure all of you are. Studio Pratt believes that the era of ego is over and that the era of the star architect is over. The future is in collaboration and in trying to connect to people from outside of our industry. Brecht deals with topics that will define our future. How can we accommodate to a rising population with an ecological way of building? How can architecture create a sense of identity, a sense of time, and a sense of place? And how can architecture be part of the food production and help feed an ever-growing population? Studio Prec firmly believes that architecture can be an aid to these tasks and be more than just a consuming island in the city. Buildings should be part of our productive grid and should be able to give back to the surrounding and community. This is a small snippet from Studio Prec's uh, website. And Chris has specifically asked me not to read out his bio. He sent us two lines in his bio that are very informal and personal, which I highly appreciate. And I think he will expand a bit more on that in his lecture. So please join me in welcoming the very humble, the super talented Chris Brecht. Thanks, Ria. Um, yeah, I mean, about, about the bio, or about the CV, I think um, CVs in general are a very weird uh, thing to write. Um, I think like every CV in a way sounds exactly the same. Like we all have been at the university. Um, we all have a degree from somewhere. Um, we worked an internship at some office. And if you have an office, then, you know, you most probably are an award-winning architect because, um, well, winning awards in architecture is uh, fairly easy. And if every CV somehow, you know, sounds, sounds the same, um, then uh, I don't know why I even bother um, writing, writing one. Um, and, you know, writing a CV is also weird because, I mean, first, uh, you know, you write it maybe in first person if you want to make it really personal. Then you write something um, like, uh, I won this award. And, you know, it always sounds very braggy. And in, a, in an age of, of authenticity, especially in our kind of uh, media world, um, I think, you know, when people know that winning awards is, uh, is pretty easy, um, then, you know, it sounds too braggy, I think, for our time. And then, you know, it leaves you with the option to maybe write it in, in a third person. And I think that's even weirder if you write, like, uh, Chris Brecht won this award or so. Um, I think, like, bragging about yourself in a third person, uh, maybe died with Trump's Twitter account. Um, so we cannot do that anymore. So I'm, I just stick with, um, with three biggest achievements. And first is um, that I'm a proud father uh, now of Theo um, and that I somehow tricked uh, my wife Faye um, into marrying me and that we are running a, a, a small studio here in the mountains um, of Austria, um, which you know, it's not that easy than um, it might sound. 
Um, and uh, let me just uh, start my presentation. Um, I start, uh, um, which is now maybe a, a nice segue uh, to um, to you know about the lecture because it, today is not so much about um, what we are doing, not even uh, about why we are doing um, it, but more about um, how uh, we do it. Um, <clears throat> and it's one of the, yeah. So uh, yeah, and um, I called uh, the, the the lecture creativity, um, business, and culture because um, I think those are the three, or this is the tripod that actually makes uh, builds a stable foundation um, for every um, for every uh, studio. And this is probably these are the, probably the three things where every um, studio is based on, um, like. Almost uh, any lecture, um, I'm going to start also this one with my dad. Um, whoever of you have seen already a lecture of mine, um, thanks for the endurance. Um, but you guys know that my dad was a big influence um, on me. Um, he was a very talented climber. I think if you if you might ask the, the, the climbing kings um, like Heinold Messner or Oswald Oelz, they probably would agree that uh, my dad was um, one of the best uh, climbers in the world. Um, and I think climbing has a lot to do with creativity because you're looking for a creative way of how to climb uh, a summit. And I think I inherit a bit of this creativity from my dad's side. Um, but unfortunately, I also inherited his um, you know, business skills. And... Uh, you know, my dad, he was, um, he was, although he was very talented and, and skilled as a climber, he always said no to um, taking sponsorships. Um, he always said that then this would turn his hobby into a job and it would come with responsibilities uh, that he doesn't want to, ha to have. So he would like to keep his passion um, for climbing and not turn it uh, into his work. And this resonated uh, a lot with me, unfortunately, also for the business side of our office. So um, I have to warn you maybe before I, I'm going to start that, um, you know, I, um, I'm probably the wrong person to, um, to deliver this message. Uh, I actually talked to Faye um, about this, that I want to, um, that I want to have a, have a, uh, a talk today about the business side and he uh, she just um you know rolled her eyes uh um because she knows me like i'm i'm a, i don't know the um the code to our bank cards uh i don't know the password to our online banking and actually i get like some pocket money every week uh, from Faye, and this turns me into the happiest person um so I, you know i'm an introvert person i like creativity i like design i like uh, ideas i like experiment but i actually don't care so much about business and finance um but I still do it and I still have to do it. And um, I might be the wrong person to deliver this message, but it also maybe underlines um, the importance uh, of um, business, um, you know, even though you're super annoyed um, by it. Um, yeah. Uh, maybe also one more thing uh, before um, I start. This is not an how-to guide um this is uh, um it's more like an honest conversation um about what i've learned um the last years about the mistakes uh, we have made and what i'm pissed off and find annoying um about uh, about our industry so it's more maybe not in how to guide of how to be a mountain uh, how to be an architect in the mountains of nowhere um but more like a like a support group um and i'm now the first speaker um in our group uh and in our like aa meeting um architects uh, anonymous and uh, this is a very personal um take uh, on that um, so this is what works maybe for Faye uh, and me in our studio, but that doesn't have to mean that, uh, you know, these things actually work for everyone. And I have actually thought about this lecture quite a lot 
but I've never spoken it out loud. Um, that, you know, like, um, like you probably know how this is when you have an argument in your head um, and it sounds very convincing and you think that next time that if there is this discussion about this topic, I, I totally bring this argument and then, you know, this argument happens in real life and you speak it out loud and just gibberish comes out. And I'm a bit worried that today is similar because I have this somehow in my head, but I don't know how it comes out. So I hope there is a, a somewhat of a coherent uh, string of thoughts uh, somewhere in there. Okay, so um, let's dive uh, into the lecture today. Um, so today it's about uh, creativity and business and culture. So actually this tribot uh, of our studio, like I, like I said before, um, like all very important parts to actually build, build a foundation uh, for a studio. I have some, uh, I have some of you asked uh, last week to uh, write me some questions. Um, some of those questions I received, uh, I weave them into the lecture. Um, and you will see them on the on the bottom side. I don't address the questions, but uh, based on the topics I'm talking about, you might uh, uh, find them answered in, in, in some sort of way. Um, all right, so this is a very personal approach, as I have said, and to give you a little bit of an overview of how we are in this uh, kind of um, business categories uh, of studios. Um, I found some some graphs uh, online um, and I adapted them uh, a little bit. So all of these graphs actually can, can vary a bit, but uh, these give you a little bit of an oversight of different categories of businesses uh, in architecture. So first, of course, there is the, the freelancer or the one person um, studio. Um, these uh, make usually around uh, yeah around fifty to hundred twenty thousand dollars to to survive based on you know wherever the, uh, the, those those people are located uh, on our globe. Um, if you want to actually, um, what I learned uh, in the last part, uh, couple of years especially when we started to hire, if you want to calculate um, your own salary or if you want to calculate the salaries um, of your employees, you usually take the net salary they have and you multiply it by 2.5 to 2.7. Um, then, then you reach somewhat the real costs um, actually your salary has on the company or an employee's salary has on the company. And this actually includes already something like taxes, insurance, um, also um, software computers, office rent, um, but also maybe, you know, fees for a photographer um, or uh, maybe a little bit of the profit uh, at the end of the year that can go then back into the company. Um, so the first one, uh, first step would be like a freelancer. Um, the second one is these small studios with one to seven people um, that happens when you know the workload uh, increases and the revenue increases as well you somehow start hiring and you have to establish first um, business rules like when to start what the work hours are and what the team structure is I actually thought that working in these small studios was always a lot of fun because you get a lot of responsibility as an employee um, and you get also a lot of design liberty um, to bring in um, your own voice uh, to the company, um, which is always a, a, a very nice um, 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 uh, way to work, not for a company, but actually with the company. And I think that happens uh, well in those small structured um, companies and if you are lucky you know you also can grow uh, with the firm when they are when you're joining them when they are small so in a long-term strategy you also could create some ownership um, in the company um, the third step would be uh, companies that are medium sized those are around seven to 25 uh, people and there you need to establish already a really clear book of, of guidelines you might also need to hire outside of architecture, like um, business developers, um, HR, uh, or some management uh, people. These offices also are usually more layered, um, but they are still a very good place to work, I think, because you still get responsibility um, and usually you get a lot of diverse projects. Um, and you have more people from different industries um, to actually learn from. Um, and the first... Uh, 
uh, and the fourth step in those offices um, would be the king of our industries. Um, I don't have a lot of insight into this, uh, into these um, studios, um, but uh, you know, um, I was never near anything uh, like this. But if you look at uh, at companies like Big or um, Foster, you know, they really managed to actually grow um, their business through all of those steps to a kind of a legacy studio where the studio itself can actually outlive the founders. Um, and I think that takes incredible leadership um, on uh on yeah on on the management team um, of those studios so from my personal experience um i can talk uh to three um, of those uh, stu- three of those categories so my f- first um office uh, i founded was called panda and as panda we grew um quite quickly um we had always like for three years we had between eight and 15 people and of course, like leading uh, an office like this also, and when the office then grows, it also changes your own tasks uh, you have on hand. Um, I I like very much to be hands-on on projects. I love modeling. I love rendering. I still model uh, a lot and I still render everything. Um, and I don't like to to actually be a boss that um, that looks at the project at the end of the day um, and then change something before deadlines and, and something like this. I like to be very involved, but, you know, growing then a team um, out of 15 uh, of fifteen people, um, I didn't really enjoy that. Um, I didn't enjoy this process of growing. Um, I felt quite burned out um, by the city, by the stress it comes with. Um, and by the responsibility of having, you know, a large team that you have to keep, keep working. Um, and it felt a little bit like a hamster, you know, uh, always hustling uh, forward, but never going anywhere um, in this little hamster wheel. Um, so for ourselves, we decided then um, that we have to change something. Um, at this moment, uh, actually, my, my dad um, had, a, had a climbing accident um, and died. And uh, we moved then back, we, d- we make the decision to move back uh, to the mountains um, of Austria, um, mainly because, you know, my, I'm a single um, son. I, my mom uh, was somewhat alone at home, so we wanted to live somewhere near her. And But we also wanted to start a family and have a bit of a, of a healthier lifestyle around it. Uh, so we moved from Beijing then back to the mountains to also create then a studio here where we can um, grow on our own pace and not constantly, you know, hustle uh, behind some some projects. Um, and but that was also a huge blow for for our architectural ego uh, in a way, um, because before, you know, we had clients, we had a medium sized office, uh, we had a pretty good business, um, we had a very nice uh, office with um, really cool projects. And now we were sitting on our kitchen table um, without any employees, just Faye and me. And we were working, we were asking ourselves, you know, what, what the heck uh, did we do there? Um, so the first time it was quite hard. Um, it came, of course, with a huge cut uh, to our salary. But at the other hand, you know, we didn't, need a lot um we lived quite responsibly um we grew in nature we grew uh, we still grow um, a lot of our own food and we worked quite comfortable actually in this first step uh, of you know freelance or one person in our case a uh, two people office um and slowly then you know we we grew um, as a company, like some clients came back, uh, we built a small studio um, to our house. Um, we hired them two people um, yeah, near me. Um, and now we are here a team of four people. Um, and we have a little satellite studio as well um, in Shanghai um, with a person. So we are now somewhere in, in step two. Um, and you know, I've be, been in, in all of those uh, three steps and I know some people of, of the fourth step, 
uh, like an, I know already some uh, star architect. I even have some of the numbers. Um, I, you know, I learned two things uh, uh, maybe um, in these these uh, categories. So I think the first one is that those steps are not necessarily made for climbing. Um, I think that success is not measured um, in this hierarchy um, of uh, of steps. Uh, you know, you can be successful in any of those categories um, as long as your main goal is not growth. Um, because in China, you know, I always wanted to grow. Um, I wanted to grow the team. I wanted to grow the projects, the, the impact uh, we, ha we have, the, also the fame uh, in a way. So this was somehow my definition of success. But um, now living in the mountains and working with a small team, I would, uh, I, I would uh, define success differently. Like I want to be happy with what I'm doing and I want to be fulfilled uh, what we are doing and as an architect i think no matter in which of those categories you are um, you can be either happy or unhappy um, in those steps and this very thin line uh, between happy and unhappy is actually to be able to say no to projects um, that was one of my uh, biggest realization that we have to be in some kind of um, step where we are able to say no to a project. So I'm much rather in category two um, and be, be happy there and be able to say no to projects. Then I would have a bigger team and would be in category three um, and have a larger team around me, but I have to hustle constantly and take on all the projects, although, you know, the client doesn't fit to us or the, the, the project doesn't fit to us um, or it's just, you know, two less um, fees um, in the end. So I'm, yeah, I much rather um, be then on um, in the second category. And the second thing I've learned is that in no matter in which category you are um, as an architect, um, architects always feel underpaid. And I think that starts maybe already with university because we, most of us enter university not um, as a career choice, um, but more out of a passion choice. Um, it's our hobby. You know, we love doing it. And this is probably the greatest thing about architecture. Um, but this then continues to doing internships. You know, we did internships uh, without getting paid. Um, and it's still the case. Um, but you take them then as a student by, well, it's my hobby anyway. And, um, you know, I can work for this um, Pritzker Prize winning architect and it would look fantastic in my CV. And maybe this, you know, wheel then also continues then when you have your own office. And this is no matter in which category of those four you are with your office. If you're small, you know, you constantly feel you have to underbid um other offices, and that's why I drop down with my fees. If you're a medium studio, you have this constant responsibility, and that's why you might go down uh, with your fees. And even as a big offices, you know, they um, they shouldn't be the same, but today there are still offices which have more than 200 people and where the staff is still working overtime. Um, working weekends uh, and, uh, you know, uh, not or being underpaid um, for internships or running on underpaid uh, internships. Um, and you know that those big offices, they actually should have the fees to finance, you know, this big backpack they are carrying. Um, so, you know, they also either charge um, to less uh, or the money is then more concentrated on, on upper management of the firm. Or, you know, um, offices are still uh, are just um, in um, over their heads. And yeah, and maybe there are two reasons why this is happening. And one is for sure that there is not enough education, like you before said, uh, Riyadh, that there is not enough education about um, business and about finance, especially for creative people. Um, and the second reason is for sure that we are not talking enough uh, about this, um, that we like and love to talk about design, but we are not talking enough about the business of design. And I think, yeah, maybe this also can change through. 
this support group um, of architects anonymous um so i thought a lot about uh, about business in a way but more about you know what kind of office i actually really would like to have because i was very worried that if we would grow too fast we are completely in uh, over our heads um, that we don't have the necessary education for business um, and that we you know this ends up in chaos um, so we somehow try to restart our office um, in the mountain in the right way you know like really paying our employees fairly um, having fair work hours. Um, they are not working overtime, our employees. They are never working uh, weekends. Um, so, yeah, for us, um, and if we need, you know, we um, grow, but uh, we want to grow um, responsibly. Um, we want to grow in a um, in a responsible method that we look, okay, can we afford really to hire somebody in a, in a kind of a one-year plan um, or, you know, can't we? Um, and we never make then staff decisions if we would get a big project where we would need to hire. We probably won't hire um, because the money is not yet in our bank account. It's just, you know, written in a contract. Um, so we always pay, uh, hire based on the money we have uh, on, on our account and what our forecast, not what our forecast might, uh, might be. Um, and, you know, like um, that meant for us that this was never a kind of a um, getting rich um, kind of scheme, but more of, a, um, you know, how can I uh, work in this industry and still uh, wear sweatpants in a way? Or how can I, how can I wear sweatpants uh, professionally? Um, and of course, with this one, you know, we also need to accept that we probably will never get an airport or a stadium um, as a as a studio. But uh, we feel good, you know, the base we have now, and we feel good that this is kind of a a good uh, long term um, strategy uh, for for an office. Um, which brings me to to business models uh, for for architecture. Um, we. We are in a um, in a kind of a service based uh, business model. So we usually um, have a client, and we trade our design skills and we trade our creativity based on the client needs, um, demands, um, and and maybe budget. Um, like for example, here I actually um, took a video of my, of our last. Uh, uh, a client meeting where we presented very proudly a tower um, uh, a tower scheme and uh, yeah then the client apparently uh, didn't like it like it too much but I mean it the, the tower itself was completely off the color scheme didn't fit that well and maybe in the end you know our client uh, didn't want uh, to have a tower at all but more like a scattered um, village uh, typology um, so, um, yeah, Rem Koller has actually said about our business that we are in the business um, of uniqueness. Um, and this can be a very beautiful business because there's constantly something new happen, right? You, you build unique buildings for a unique, unique site um, for a unique client. Um, but he also said that we always do prototypes and we never go into productions. And I think there was on a business level or from business people, there would be three big issues um, about this, uh, this business model. I think the first one is that it is not the scalable business model itself. Because if we as a firm um, are doing, for example, a house for a client, uh, then you know, we would uh, calculate with um, myself and maybe one more employee um, as a project architect who take really care about this house. But when you get an airport, um, let's say a small um, office and you get one day an airport, you need to hire than 20 people. So actually, it's not like uh, an industrial designer who designs a beautiful chair and this chair then can sell a million times. Um, it's more like, you know, that your business has to always scale um, with uh, the, the responsibilities and the projects uh, you have. And therefore, it's not really um, a scalable model. I think the second uh, problem I have uh, with this business model is that creativity is not necessarily valued um, in this model. Um, if you, uh, <clears throat> yeah, um, you know, like, 
I think every country has some rules uh, what architecture can ask for fees. Um, at least in Austria, is it like this? In, in China, it was like that. In Germany, um, it was like that. Um, but these fee structures, they are all made for projects that go straight from the beginning um, to the end. Um, so, uh, you know, like... Um, like somehow like like this so it, it goes from the start to finish and it think it thinks that this creative process um follows this line um but actually the creativity works far different right the process takes very weird paths in creativity so you design something and then you see oh my god MVRDV did something similar you change it um, you work yourself into a ditch where you cannot come out of and you somehow need to take a break um, of this whole creative process. You restart from the beginning, and then you find somehow a path um, of how to come to a to a really beautiful end that works. Um, but this process is not really valued in our business model. Just the result is. And um, so, for example, I was uh, working on a on a small project last year. I I actually hate if architects are saying. I was working because uh, usually behind every architect um, is a big team or is a team uh, who is also working it. Um, but this was really last year um, before we started to hire um, and Faye was already um, pregnant. So it was really me um, I was working on. And that's why I also know how much hours I spent uh, in the end of the project. So this one was the, was a small project um, where the budget was around, for example, was around 500,000 uh, euro. Um, based on the Austrian fee structure, I'm actually allowed to charge 12.5% um, uh, of the construction costs. But that includes construction drawings and it includes shop drawings and it includes um, um, uh, site supervision. Um, for this time, I calculated, we just did um, the concept design, which would be around 25% uh, percent, uh, of, of the 12.5%, which would uh, take us at around 16,000. At the same document of this Austrian fee structure, it tells you how much an architect can actually ask for an hourly fee. And this one would be for a firm owner um, at around 150 uh, euro per hour. So that would make it that I am somehow allowed to work around 100 hours for this project. Um, so I still can make a little profit in the end. But of course, you know, the creative process works very differently. Um, I spent then around 1,200 hours, um, which put my actual um, hourly fee at around 13 uh, euro per hour. Um, so. Yeah, much less actually what you would make it working at McDonald's. Um, but you know, it still somehow, it was still somehow worth it. It was a fantastic, uh, uh process. I really liked the client and really liked uh, working with him and, uh, or with them. And, uh, now the project is getting built. So, you know, uh, but you know, it, it tells you somehow that creativity is just a very, messy business and i think that also the client is not you know like you have to ask your client is the client really responsible to pay for our messiness in a way um, and maybe then as an architect we also need to make the decision of um, how much of this creative process are we willing uh, to give up uh, um, on the uh, on the path um, and you know maybe that is the, the the real struggle in in architecture because business is very predictable, um, but creativity is not predictable. Um, business is about intelligence, um, but creativity is about um, imagination and innovation, um, and those are very different uh, things because intelligence is what you actually use. Uh, when you want to reach a goal, um, but creativity is what you use when you don't know what the goal is. Um, so it is somewhere the difference between what is and what could be. And that maybe that is the eternal struggle um, of uh, a business model um, in architecture. And 
Um, yeah, and the third issue I uh, I have with um, um, with the with our current business model is the that the process is still um, very intransparent um, for a client. Um, you know, a client comes with the budget and with a vague brief, but has no idea um, what the outcome is going to be. And you know, if this creative process is so messy with an up and down and with struggling and failing, um, then you know, I also would be a little bit worried as a client that uh, I would not get this thing out um, what I came for. Um, so, you know, this process is uh, is very intransparent um, um, in architecture. Um, yeah, so I got very interested uh, in a way about um, alternative um, business models uh, um, to where you actually use creativity once and you can uh, create a product um, that can adapt and further, um, but uh, yeah, not the service-based uh, business model, but more of a product-based um, business model. Um, we do this mostly with uh, speculative projects um, where, um, yeah, where we invent the brief um, or where we invent something that we think will be important for the future. Um, these projects, they don't come from a client, um, but uh, we self-initiate them. So there is no client now um, in the present, but there, it could be that there is a future client um, somewhere um, along the line. And in our office now, we always work on these two types of projects. So one with a client that deals with responsibilities for a client that deals with the budget, that deals with compromise, um, that deals with site and climatic constraints. Um, and then the other projects that uh, somewhere, um, um, yeah, where we initiate something. Um, and these are mostly projects that deal with um, like some sort of bis, uh, some sort of building systems, um, modular um, modular elements, um, and uh, material um, research. So something you cannot necessarily do when you are, you don't have necessarily the time always when you have a client. Um, I show you a couple of those projects um, we worked on um, lately. Um, uh, <clears throat> So this one was, for example, a project that we started um, with this intention of creating a different uh, sort of business model. Um, we developed a kind of a modular bamboo structure. We then built a lot of kind of, a, of models and material investigations of how can we stack together and how can we build a joint that is uh, reproducible that can extend in different directions and that the building can then extend um, further on, um, tested out a couple of structures, um, built uh, and financed, you know, like 700 uh, bamboo canes and built with our team uh, uh, different structures to really test them. And then uh, we figure out, well, the first joint, it was, it was stable for the, for the thing, but what if we want to also grow it in height? Is there a, a kind of a system where we can bundle bamboo? Um, and then we, um, uh, re, uh, reused, um, uh, car tires and, you know, like, um, set it as a kind of a spacer uh, in between bamboo canes and then bundled them. And so one bamboo beam actually can grow as well in height because you can stack them, um, on top of each other. Um, and then we were able, you know, to build kind of different, uh, and higher structures. Uh, with the same thing. So all of this still happened without having a client all through material investigation, testing uh, over a period of around for sure two or three, two, two years for sure. Um, after that, we published um, that. We made it open to, to everyone, um, um, our investigations. And, you know, through publication, people saw it. And, and thought, okay, that might be something I actually want to try on my site. Um, you know, why don't you why don't you send over your project architect and we build this uh, together um, here? And then, yeah, we built a, a structure, for example, here in Ecuador, um, where this is a kind of a hotel and very really beautiful location where we source uh, local bamboo um, and. Uh, build this structure based on our material investigations um, we did before. And of course, you also want to give them a vision 
you know, like what would be possible maybe one day, you know, what's next after that? So yes, client, that's fantastic that you build it, but we have a much bigger vision um, how this actually can adapt uh, in the future and grow. And then, you know, the client also feels that he's part of a journey, that he um, is part of this um, design and part of this vision of how to bring this um, into into reality, gets um, even more excited about the whole process. Um, so the same happened actually with our farmhouse. Um, probably some of you have seen it already, um, so I don't go too much into the details, but um, based on where we live now, you know, and sourcing our own food and, uh, you know, growing and harvesting and being one in this whole production of food and getting our hands dirty, um, we were looking as well of how can we bring this concept into our city and how actually changed food um, in history um, why is it now not in our city anymore? So we did this whole investigation and research um, uh, what this whole process is as well doing to our health and uh, the health of our society. Um, and maybe, you know, how could, can we turn it into, into something better? And maybe how we can turn it into um, some building model that um, combines architecture with agriculture and maybe both as an industry that is heavily polluted, um, can um, benefit uh, from each other. Um, yeah, and uh, a third um, a third project uh, would be the um, this one. Uh, also, some of you might have seen it. Um, we also started a different a, a second company for that, uh, which is called Baumba which I uh, founded together with uh, uh, Faye and uh, our friend uh, Rudy, who comes more from the business side. So we somehow, you know, uh, combined business and design in a bit of a different uh, way. And there we, you know, looked of how can we actually build stru uh, structures um, that come from a different and kind of perspective from a child's perspective, how would children maybe see buildings? How can we create really unique buildings in a way? Um, but also, you know, how to create buildings that are on a very small footprint, um, that don't cover too much land, uh, and uh, that grow more um, uh, vertically. Um, yeah, and now we're also in the process of building the first um, six uh, of, of those, you know, um, how can we actually source them? So there is going a lot of, uh, of resource uh, in this and a lot of construction drawing and all of this one was as well done first before we had a client. And after that, we published it. Um, we found now, um, well, we found a couple of clients. Um, we um, choose very carefully where we build it at the moment. So at the moment, we have two locations where we build them. And once they are successful and running, um, then we can expand uh, this into the future. But as well here, maybe offering another, you know, view that, you know, this doesn't need to stop with your project. Um, this can actually go on. and There could be a broader future um, um, uh, for, um, for these kind of structures. And you as a client um, can be part of this vision um, we create. So I kind of like these, um, uh, these, uh, these kind of alternative business models um, because they are scalable because you're not working as a service you're working um uh, you're working on a product um and like this chair you know it can reproduce uh, four different locations as well so it, you have then a, 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 a good business or a scalable business model at least um then also creativity in this whole process is valued again because um you know you can put a price on your creativity or the creativity that you use to create that. Um, so you can um, sell it for more percent, you know, however high you value your creativity as a product in the end. Um, and also the relation between the client um, and the architect becomes very transparent because the client probably has seen that before. He comes to us for a reason. He has seen that, he likes it, it fits to his place. It fits to exactly what he wants to um, to create, um, and then we can, you know, because everything is modular, we can customize it 
um, to their needs and the demands. You know, for example, for the last project uh, I showed for the for Bird for this tree house, um, we have an algorithm. So the client comes to us and says, the, uh, "We need uh, three bedrooms in one of those birds. We need a kitchen and we need a living room." And then we can give him immediately five different options how um, this uh, this tree house would be configured, um, with ele what element goes in, how much glass we have, all the elements uh, already. We also know the price then exactly. Um, so this process of working uh, becomes. Uh, um, uh, very transparent and the client also because he sits with us on the computer and knows exactly what's going on and what our steps are um, uh, feels also a little bit um, part of this process uh, which is always good um, so I really like this kind of business model especially um, for um, for small um, uh, for small uh, studios um, I think that is actually a great alternative um, to doing competitions. Um, our first project was also because we won a competition, um, but I, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, a bit uh, against doing uh, too many competitions in a in a small, especially in a small studio. Um, you know, um, it, it was when I was a student. It was always said that. Um, that uh, competitions, uh, or professors, everyone said that competitions are a, a nice equalizer between studios, between big studios and small studios. Because um, you, um, and that's, that might be true, because for one competition, if it's anonymous, you know, a small studio can win and a big um, studio can win. So there is a bit of a balance, but that's, not entirely the whole truth about competitions, because as a small office, um, you know, you're still in a very unbalanced system to big offices. Um, so if you enter a competition, first of all, you know already that you will probably lose or you don't know it, but you, um, you are prepared to lose and you also prepared to, to lose the investment you took in a competition. Um, and th these are immense expenses you have as a small office doing a competition. So, for example, let's say there was this Guggenheim uh, competition in Helsinki a couple of years back. Um, I think 1,200 studios also competed. Um, we, thank God, we didn't. Um, but, uh, you know, let's say you work on something like this. You, um, on average, you probably put around three people on a competition, two employees and maybe one intern. With your, um, with the owner's time, then, you know, you, uh, and you work around six to seven weeks. So that's for at least, um, at least 30,000, um, euro, uh, you have to spend, um, on a competition like this. Um, and that's already like one tenth, uh, of the revenue I showed before for an average uh, small studio. Um, and, you know, large offices, they have the same expense, um, but they have much more revenue per year. So they could maybe they have hundred to a thousand times more revenue um, per year. So they could lose hundreds to a thousand of those competition in a row that it hurts them similar than it hurts a small office to lose one competition. So, you know, um, this, uh, it's not really a balanced, uh, path to do too many competitions because in the end you create again a unique building for a unique client on a unique site uh, for a unique condition um, and in the end when you lose a competition it ends in your kind of cemetery um, drawer anyway um, so maybe before like 20 years ago or so it was a bit different um, people, uh, small studios entered the competition for a different reason um, it was probably mainly to be seen, um, to get your work uh, shown to an audience. Um, so when you were good in a competition, there was an exhibition maybe afterwards, um, or it was published in a magazine or in one of the big uh, media outlets um, like the scene or design boom or so. But I think especially this, the, the publishing world in architecture 
um, has changed uh, dramatically, Demo democratized um, it a lot, you know, um, like I think that Amanda and her architecture Hunter um, now has probably more uh, the, if you publish there, you are seen by more people than actually um, on on the big uh, media outlets. So the, and there are you know and many of those um, publishing medias medias on, on Instagram and on the web. Um, so you know there are different ways actually how you, your um, projects can be shown. So it doesn't have to be necessarily anymore um, through a competition. So rather than spending um, 30,000 euro on a competition as a small office and getting your ass beaten by uh, by Biarki or by MVRDV, um, I, I'd rather, you know, as a, as a studio, design some um, or develop something that uh, is a long-term vision and you always de develop it further and that might be important or an important statement um, for the future uh, rather than a unique uh, building somewhere in a unique location. And I think that also plays into um, a third, this, into this third uh, footing um, I was saying it before, and this is culture. Um, how you actually build up uh, uh, is a, a healthy studio culture um, for people to work at. Um, so, you know, to, to have a kind of a studio where people are enthusiastic to work. And I think they are much uh, like, at least I can, I can uh, from my perspective, I think uh, our team is much more excited to work on something self-initiated like this, uh, you know, what they really can develop and where they can see a, really a vision. Um, then to work on a competition and uh, it's ended then, you know, and it has strict deadlines because this one you always can develop and develop uh, uh, further. Um, and, you know, um, yeah. So uh, I think this also builds a very nice kind of studio culture um, to have like two kind of pro two types of projects. So one is this type that comes with the client um, but on the other hand, you know, you have those self-initiated projects um, that creates a lot of artistic um, freedom and no compromises on, on budgets or on uh, on whatsoever. Um, yeah, uh, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, um, I, I think I got like one, maybe one more questions I got uh, from you guys before I want to address, you know, how to actually can you then handle if you don't want to grow um, based on the money that it's in the studio's bank account uh, uh, when you want to grow based on the money that it's on the studio's bank account and not uh, what the forecast is or not on the signed um, contracts like how would you then be able to um, to work on bigger projects and I think that is you know to collaborate uh, with uh, with pro uh, with um, other young architects, um, I think there can be a lot of things achieved um, if you put your ego not on on the top, um, but if you you know push your ego a little bit to side and you know ask other teams, you know um, how about we uh, collaborate on this one. Um, and you know instead of hiring then ten people, um, and if the project dies, you have to fire. 10 people again, you know, I rather um, ask other studios to collaborate with us. Um, for example, we did a collaboration um, with a great studio in Vienna called Smartfall. We did one with Arthur um, last year. Um, we um, we uh, start working uh, with Jill um, on something. And now uh, we're working on a bigger project with my ex-boss um, who has um, still his own um, office and I could bring uh, a project uh, to him and we col collaborate then 50-50 um, on a project like this. And I think this also keeps a, a good um, uh, studio culture um, because it's not just, you know, within the studio we are in interacting with each other, um, but, you know, you get to know um, other studios, how they work. You have an insight uh, in other studios and they most of the time also have a whole different um, skill set, you know, like for Arthur, I think we have a 
a good skill set and Arthur has a fantastic skill set when it comes to technology and how to transfer his inspiration through technology uh, to manufacturing. So, you know, you always can then uh, learn from each, other, from each other. And I think that's uh, really fantastic um, to build up a good, um, enthusiastic um, uh, studio culture on your own. And I think that create I think a, a good studio culture is something um, incredibly important. Um, you know, sometimes we have to remind ourselves uh, that we are architects. Um, and if we are lucky, we will never retire. Um, so for us, this should be a long-term game and a long-time uh, strategy. Um, and I think that, you know, mental and physical health, if you tie, if you uh, think long term are the backbone um, of a studio, um, and uh, yeah, and you know, architecture in this way is much more like a marathon um, and uh, than a sprint. And I think you get really good as an architect when you are in the sixties and when you have a lot of experience and when you have a lot of confidence uh, and you know, a build up uh, a kind of a client base. A base uh, who who continues to work with us. So it would be really pity if you know pushing out your energy and all your motivation um, for, for actor uh, when you're young. So we try really to build up a kind of a, a healthy um, environment. And actually, I meet really a lot of people um, that uh, are enthusiastic when they study. Um, but they start to, or they, they somehow get worn out by architecture when they start working um, in a firm. And I find that, like as a concept, I find it really weird because, of course, it's really beautiful to work on your concept design um, as a student. Um, but it must be much more fulfilling when you are able to put those concepts into reality. So actually working, having your own studio or working for a studio um, should increase enthusiasm for architecture and not um, decrease. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think that like enthusiasm of young architects is probably the greatest good um, we have um, in our industry, but still there are a lot of, of, of offices, you know, that are growing too fast and not understanding um, the business base uh, of the studio who are somehow crushing this enthusiasm um, with inexperience in business questions. Um, and they, then they run on exploitation, on underpayment uh, and so forth. And I think that is not healthy not for individuals um, and not for our industry. So I don't know if, you know, th these kind of strategies of self-initiated projects of the embracement of staying small as a firm and of um, collaboration between teams um, is the future in architecture. Um, but I think at least that's, how we tried or have to try it here because I mean, we are far away from everything else. Um, and um, yeah, I don't know um, where this actually is going to. Um, I just know that uh, it's going pro probably pretty slow. Um, and I think that's a pretty good thing. Um, yeah. And with this, uh, Riyad, I give back to you. Well, that was uh, an extremely inspiring uh, talk, uh, Chris. And uh, someone here on the chat said, I love how it feels like a storytelling and mentoring more than a talk, which I completely agree with. And it's very intimate, uh, in intimate and inspiring. And I love this energy. So, I mean, we're, we're getting a lot of positive feedback here from the audience. And Yeah, really, if I would have done like a, a kind of a talk or a how-to talk right i don't have the necessary experience uh, to do that i would i could never write a book um, you know these are your steps to be a successful architect because i don't even know what success means so um you know i i try somehow just like an honest kind of take on in what situation we are at the moment it, it was completely unconventional in the way that we do these lectures and i really respect and admire that because uh, i appreciate it that you know, we got more out of it as an audience. And I speak for myself and my team. We're on the group chat here talking about how great it is to finally get some insight from someone. And, and you're very humble to say that, um, you know, 
you don't know what success is, but you know, obviously you've reached some uh, really good levels of success in your career. Uh, now that speaks to your journey. And I completely understand that this journey is not, you know, applicable to a lot of people. Um, and that's where you're coming from. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, some of the points that you brought up have been on my mind personally as, as a business owner, a recent business owner as well. And you say you don't have enough experience, but uh, you've been in the game for a lot longer than I have, so to speak. Because I've is only, it? yeah, yeah, we've started our practice, uh, mean Middle East Architecture Network only two years ago. And okay. um, it started actually three years ago, uh, the first year was uh, almost like a side project and we were doing competitions. So I love that point that you made about competitions because we quickly pivoted once things started getting real, you know, once we had overheads and we, it's not, you know, something we do on the side. I had a job in New York uh, back then when we started and I'd come back from the office and I, you know, start working on things that are a bit more fulfilling for myself, such as doing competitions with a small team that put together. And uh, now once I moved to Dubai and started the business, obviously you have overheads, you have people Hey, you have uh, you see ups and downs and you know this journey teaches you that you have it pushes you almost like when you throw a baby in a swimming pool and they teach themselves how to swim that's how doing a business in my opinion uh, almost is because yeah but that's i think it it, it shouldn't be like that should it um, should it? yeah because i agree with the sentiment that you brought up that you know we as architects do not have what it takes from early educational uh, phases of our career, you know, we haven't been integrated into this culture of, of the business of, of, of design because we always, you know, have been taught these concepts and ideals and ethos that, you know, to some extent also are not applicable to our day and age. Um, and not enough focus on, um, on, on uh, business skills. Yeah, I mean, you probably also always also have to, you know, balance it out because I think coming to its architecture from, too much business background wouldn't also be good, right? Like mm -hmm. I heard a, a talk from uh, uh, Greg from Snow, the founder of Snohetta, and I think they, their first project was the Alexandria Library, right? And he said if they wouldn't have been so naive, they would have never taken this project. So a certain naivety um, is can be really good uh, um, in this whole process as well. So I think that's always the balance you somehow need to take as an architect. Like, where is creativity and where is the business side? And are there projects where you can just throw away everything you've learned about business and you, you know, um, yeah, uh, it's always a bit of a balance. Just a note to the audience, they actually won that competition as students uh, and, and, and then started Snohetta, uh, which was a very interesting yeah. way to start a company. And I think also in our day and age, You know, architects today have become more redundant in a way. You know, the creativity aspect of, of architecture is slowly becoming diminished. And uh, that's something that we should hold very, uh, you know, we should, we should be very conscious of because if less and less architects go into the business, uh, into the creative stream and leave the, uh, or uh, so go, go, sorry, if more and more architects go into the business stream and, and leave the creative stream, then, you know, what is architecture anymore? It's almost just a replication of, know what we've had in the past 50 years which is something i strongly disagree with absolutely um you, you also can see that way right like i i somehow um um uh touched this point a little bit that actually you know business comes a lot from the intelligent side of things right so it's very predictable um what business should do um but it's very imp unpredictable what creativity should do right and um you know with the coming age of artificial intelligence right if All of the business are on the intelligent, intel, uh, intelligent side of uh, of architecture. They probably would get redundant, right? If uh, if creativity doesn't do anything anymore. I mean, we see that in a lot of um, businesses or industries outside of uh, creative industries, right? Where um, companies get McKinsey, right? And all you know, they get uh, streamlined to be as efficient as somehow possible. Um, and everything that is not efficient, you know, gets somehow cut away or they get like a little room somewhere in the building and say, okay, here you can be creative, um, but just from two to five or so. Right. So, um, you know, like, um, and I think we also need to worry a lot that, uh, this doesn't happen to architecture with, um, with, with more and more uh, of, of artificial intelligence and, and, um, and things that could take away this the intelligent part of the job from us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
that's an excellent point. And I mean, I'd, I'd love to get to the questions because we have a lot of them. But just one more point also on the idea that you brought up of uh, sort of bringing out new business models to keep your uh, architecture practice afloat, uh, such as like, for example, developing a system for construction and so on. And I completely agree with this. I mean, you know, as, as you know, this platform that we're on right now is some, somewhat a, a sort of the, the, the child of an idea of how can we actually survive through COVID? Because the beginning of this year, we had three projects, one after the other, put on hold. And all of a sudden, I had to be pushed again to crunch the numbers and find out that, okay, we have to find out a way to generate some income, even to just pay our bills, which, I mean, uh, but in the same time, you know, it's always a balance between what you really want to do and the things that you aspire to and something that would be beneficial to your path and somewhere to also make some profit because that's important to survive. So with Live Academy, you know, talks like this are completely open and free. And that's something that we're all learning from, including my team. Uh, but we have some classes that are paid and those that's also a financial model that helps us and helps our collaborators abroad. So um, again, also touching on the idea of collaboration, which I think is very important. And I hope that we collaborate on something one day, Chris. So uh, let's get to the questions. Uh, we have a lot of them here, so I'll try to go through them very quickly with the 30 minutes that we have or so. Um, and I'll uh, also open, uh, because I promised this, maybe very briefly, uh, I'll open room for some of our attendees to go on camera. So some of them have raised their hand uh, using the raise hand uh, button down there. We can uh, promote Kanberg uh, to ask his question live on video. First of all, like, thank you very much for this uh, lecture. It was like very different, eye-opening, and also like it's really touched upon subjects that I've never even considered about before. And I mm -hmm. wanted to thank you about that first. And I've been following your works for a long time also. Like, I, they, they really gave me inspiration because like I now finished architecture school in Turkey. Like uh, my school was one of uh, the ones that was like built like six years ago. And even despite that, like innovation is not that supported. And um, when you try to do something different, they kind of uh, don't like let you. And you talked about like the business side a lot. And we actually have a course about that. But other than that, in design courses, we don't learn about it. And also like structure and technical wise, it's not really good as well. So what I was wondering was uh, as well, touching upon one of your questions, like what should I do after graduating? Should I go for competitions? What should I do? So I really want to ask you that, like, how can I, like, what are the ways to go about in learning business and like how to actually start up like a, a good business? Because I know that in the offices, they don't fairly pay you well and you can't really be creative in most of them. So like, how can I get into this world and maybe someday like um, mm -hmm. try to get closer to what you have reached right now? Yeah. And, um, uh, thanks for the, for the question. Um, and for the comments um yeah i you know like i think that i would i would have loved that i would have been as enthusiastic about business um as i was about design um so i think in our university i also went uh, my whole life to a public uh, university um uh and uh it was also i mean we probably had some business courses i don't know i would have never gone in there um but you know, I we also didn't have necessarily 3D program or software courses, um, but I still learned them because I was so enthusiastic about them. Right? Um, for business, I just wasn't. So for me, it was more like uh, Riyad said before. Um, I was thrown in, into a pool and somehow learned to swim um, or kept my head over water. Um, but uh, you know, I think you somewhere need to 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 find the um, the, this little spark that brings you a bit into the business world. Um, and from that on, then maybe you get enthusiastic uh, about it as well. Um, I've, you know, I, I never got that. And, I, I, uh, you know, yeah. like I'm far away from that. Um, but uh, like it was the same for design. I, I saw, you know, a lecture that incredibly um, uh, inspired me uh, in my first uh, year of university. And that was it for me, right? I wanted to do that. Um, and maybe there is also something uh, for business. But, um, you know, I think that business for business is very uh, different than business for creativity. I think those are very, very different things. Um, because I think that, 
in the in the architectural world, um, we I think we are very conscious people or a very conscious industry, um, and we want to add value um, to um, to our planet in a way or to our society. But actually, the business side or the economy economy or the, the, the capitalist system is somehow running on, you know, it's very profitable to exploit things. It's very profitable to destroy nature. Um, you know, for example, the, 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 the oil spill um, was very profitable um, uh, uh, for a lot of companies, um, but it destroyed a lot of ways. So, you know, there's always a very big gap between the business of business or the business of economy and the business for creative people and i think the business for creative people can be very interesting if uh, you find uh, the right entrance um, to it mm -hmm. great thank you uh, for yeah. your answer and uh, kanberg you're joining us from istanbul if i uh, uh no no actually i'm joining from uh like the seaside of turkey from like altanol which is like near the agency and uh, I'm here in a summer house, but I normally live in Ankara, which is the capital. Okay. Thank you for joining us, Kanbrek. Uh, let's go to another live question, maybe from Maria, and then we'll jump to the Q&A. Uh, host, can you please promote Maria? Uh, you know, this is one of the silver linings of the COVID situation, Chris, is that we connect to all these people from all over the world. Maria, where are you joining us from? Hi, um, so my name is Maria. I'm joining from Dubai, actually, and I'm in Dubai as well. Um, and it's so crazy. I didn't know about your platform. Um, and it's so crazy that I was, I've been following Chris and his company for almost four years now, and um, three years. Um, and for me to be connected to that and for me to be uh, knowing you here in Dubai as well, that's, that's crazy. Um, so once again, thank you so much, Chris, for being here, and thank you, Riyad, for setting this up. Um, let me get to my question. So it's, it's I think as students that have graduated, it's very difficult to start your own footprint and to make a difference in the architecture and the design industry. I come from an industry with our background. Um, and the reason why I didn't want to go into architecture is because in the Middle East region, the architecture studies is not very clear. It's not very sustainable. It's not very different. It's just very basic by the book. Um, so what really drew me to, to what really drew me to my attention is the company is that you just do what you want to do and people follow you instead of you following the norms of sustainability or the norms of an obstruction in the industry. So I think my question is, how do you do what you do um, and what you want to do and you literally disrupt the industry without even listening to others, without even looking left or right? So you're so successful with it and you're so humble with it. So I think what would your advice be um, towards that direction? Thanks, uh, Maria, for, for the nice uh, words. It might maybe, you know, like it might seem that way if you always, uh, if you look um, towards us from uh, social media or so, everything looks very nice on, on social media. Um, but I don't think like we are anywhere near disruptive, for example, like um, other architects have been in other generations. Um, but I think um, like trying to answer the question, I think it sometimes helps uh, to get a broader view of, of uh, what we do as an industry. Right? We are somehow sometimes so confined to our current state um, that we that we make a profit, that uh, we have great projects, that what, whatever happens in here, right? It, um, it it somehow really confines our point of view. But I think sometimes you need to zoom out uh, where we are as a as a kind of a species um, and what uh, what problems we actually face, right? I think like now we are. Um, I think the 10,000th generation um, in the in the species of Homo sapiens. So um, our species is around 200,000 years old, and through that there was an enormous uh, kind of um, pro progress we made, like from generation to generation to generation. And with this progress, we also made a lot of. Now we have a lot of power. We generated so much power now that we could annihilate ourselves, right? That we can wipe out ourselves um, with the power um, we uh, we invented, like with nuclear weapons, with um, viruses, with uh, climate change, um, and all of this, right? And I think that we are now in, an, in a generation where there is really a bit of a crossroad. So even we get this right, um, 
and uh, there, you know, humanity can actually strive for a long time, um, or you know, we get it wrong, and we are one of the of the, you know, we are a start of the kind of a uh, this um, disruptive generation, and that we sometimes uh, you know die off like so many other species are doing, and the, the average lifespan of a species is about one million. Years, so we still would have eight hundred thousand years to go. But I think now we are in a you know balance in where we are tilting um, towards to. Um, so I you know I think we need to get this right in our generations and other generations. They also had struggles like how make to how to make things better. But I think in our generation, when we have now this enormous power, for example, of nuclear weapons and so. Um, you know, we need to get that right. Otherwise, um, it can become very dangerous. So sometimes, you know, this zoom out to somehow look for, at us uh, and, and see, like, what do we really need to address? Um, what will be important in 30 years and 50 years? Um, and what would be a nice kind of things that we leave for our next generation um, that they have a, a, a a good life as well. I think that sometimes uh, helps with questioning the status quo um, our industry is in. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Um, I'm not going to ask another question. I was just going to say that, yes, I do live in a city that is all about sky, skyscrapers and how tall you can go. Um, and whilst that is a great achievement, I think what you said in the beginning of the presentation, you know, you have to base architecture on, on, uh, around lifestyle and health. And I just really respect that. So thank you for the time. Thanks, so, yeah. Your, uh, your comment <laughs> participation. Uh, we have a lot of questions to go through, Chris, and please feel free to cut me off uh, when you have to go. I cut you off in, in 20 minutes, okay, because I perfect. we have a date with our mom today. Um, she invited us for dinner and we go to her place and she takes um, like timing at the dinner, dinner table very serious. So um, I might cut you off in like 20 minutes. Yeah, 20 minutes would be fair enough. Uh, Anonymous is asking for a student who is unfortunate enough to graduate this year in the midst of the pandemic. How can we go forward when many firms are laying off seasoned architects? What chance do us freshers have? Mm. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I mean, you know, you said before a bit that there was also some silver lining um, in this whole thing and I just read yesterday an article um, about uh, Leonardo da Vinci and um, like the renaissance came after the pest you know the pest wiped out uh, almost half of whole Europe um, and after that uh, the renaissance emerged and you know with people like Leonardo da Vinci it was not the just an artist, um, uh, uh, mathematician, but combined so many things uh, within him, himself, right? And probably with the struggle before, um, this sort of Renaissance man, like the person who can um, have so many crafts or so many talents, uh, would have not emerged out of that. So I think every crisis is also a big chance. And maybe we also see that, you know, like Leonardo, like he designed cities and he designed uh, buildings that are still um, uh, so contemporary, you know, how to bring nature back in the city and all of these thoughts, right? Because it came from a, from a point of crisis where actually a virus um, wiped out uh, a lot of, uh, um, a lot of uh, inhabitants of the city. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, how to build a better city who, uh, that, you know, can prevent that, uh, you know, all of these questions somehow um, um, guided uh, Leonardo da Vinci um, to create something better. And I think we are also in the in the point now, right, where we can ask, you know, what potential does this have? Okay, you come out of a university, um, but this playground of architecture is now so open. I think it was never so wide than it is now, right? If you're an architect, you can, for example, make... Uh, Jewelry, you can be fantastic in jewelry. Um, all of these new industries are coming. You can be a fantastic chef and create new kind of foods. And you know, you can do a lot with your creativity. And all of these different industries are merging with architecture. Um, that you know, 
there could be in the future like a, a kind of a renaissance man like maybe arthur is one right that who is incredibly talented in design um but also knows how the construction side works and brings uh manufacturing and scripting and all of this into the into the process to to somehow bridge this gap again between uh design and manufacturing between um creativity and construction um so you know all of these kind of um, bad years um will be followed by a lot of opportunities and a lot of new ways of thinking to go um, into uh, into into a better future. Am I um, positive that this is going to happen? Mm. Not really. Um, like there is just too much of short time thinking in politics, right? And too much of um, of of tactic uh, that there is no time for strategy. Um, and there is no time for long-term thinking. Mm -hmm. um, but if then it should come from um, an industry like ours, because I think we combine a lot of those things that are important in the future, um, mm -hmm. like um, business, creativity, um, uh, traditions, and visions. Um, so there are a lot of things, you know, that are somehow on our in our skill sets. And uh, yeah, maybe it should come then from us, and that opens possibilities. I completely agree. And and for those who missed it, Arthur gave actually the first lecture of the previous semester, so you can watch it on YouTube. And it was a fantastic lecture as well. Um, so the next question from the Q&A, uh, someone is asking, how to prepare yourself to start your own practice while working in a firm? Eventually, we want to deliver our own ideas. So how could we uh, go about it? Being a young graduate, this keeps revolving in my mind. This is from Parth Chawla. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think the first step would be to work for a company that leaves you enough time um, to work on your own stuff as well. <laughs> and I think actually a, a company should do that. Um, I think a comp like, you know, um, there is nothing better than having employees um, who are also enthusiastic about architecture in their own time. Um, yeah. to work with software, to get better at it, to do competitions, um, to um, do small projects on the side, you know, to make something. So I think, you know, creativity is just wasted if uh, if you can never break out from a status quo. And uh, so first of all, work for a company that, uh, that gives you the free time uh, you need for that. Um, and secondly, I think... Uh, you said before that Snohata won their first competition when they were students. We also won the first competition while we were students. And it's somehow a little bit like this. I was writing on my diploma um, at the time. And uh, we did a lot of, uh, not a lot, but we did some competition outside. I mean, also it's a stressful time writing your diploma, but you still should... It's a bit weird to say, you know, diploma is your job and free time is actually working on another architecture project, um, like a competition. But sometimes it actually is. Um, like, for example, in our firm, when we work on a commission project, like a little bit, it feels a bit like a free time when we work uh, on some self-initiated project. But um, yeah, so um, I think to somehow balance uh, balance this in a way um, I think would be the, the way to go. Yeah, I, I completely agree, Chris. And just to add on that, from my personal experience, we started building our portfolio through these design competitions, whether, whether we won or lost. I mean, it allowed me to actually go to clients with something to show. And from my experience, it was, you know, I worked for a very demanding office. It had a great culture, but there were, the, the hours were, were insane. But it would still motivate me more to go back home at even 8 p.m. and flip open my laptop and start working on these competitions because they were almost like a vocation, you know, like it's something that drives you and, you know, also Definitely. helped me with my career working. Um, yeah, I mean, I maybe I need to relevant it a little bit, you know, about competition. I think you, sh you shouldn't necessarily do competitions when you are already a small office, like you have already, you know, commissioner work and so forth um, but as a student doing comp competition is an, uh, an incredible way of learning right you don't go in like winning the competition but then take a really good look why other pe people won this competition right what they did right or what they did different uh, than yourself I did a lot of competitions when I was a student and I, I never won a 
almost never won the competition. Um, um, but I learned uh, a lot, uh, probably more than I learned from any professor. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a great source for inspiration and 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 learning, um, but uh, not a great source um, in, a, in a kind of a business uh, strategy. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, maybe we'll jump to a question. So I'll alternate two questions live and two questions from the from the audience. And we have about uh, maybe ten more minutes with you, uh, Chris. Okay, so let's uh, promote Cody Ratburn. I am joining you from Washington State in the USA. Beautiful Welcome. office. I'm in the office, so I'm Beautiful. on the sly here. <laughs> so my question has to do with regard to these speculative projects. And, and it seems like your focus has been primarily on... Um, well, it, it, it appeals, your projects appeal to uh, a global audience or global uh, clients. But I'm wondering if you have considered or uh, delved into regional specific uh, speculative projects and, and how you went about that and how that was different from some that like we've seen all on Instagram and so on. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, especially, you know, uh, like those uh, project, especially when they deal more about the building system or something that you can um, do not based on 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 site specifics or cultural specifics uh, or climate climatic uh, uh, specifications, but it's more like a broader uh, view on things, right? How, for example, the building industry um, could change, and so so yes, that's that's for sure um, a, a question, um, and that. I think we did a lot of different kind of building systems, right? Like one, for the one with bamboo, for example. Um, this is just possible in in places where uh, where bamboo grows and where you can harvest bamboo regionally, um, and where, where it makes sense to use bamboo. So this one would be more um, in the um, in, in the southern regions, right? Mm -hmm. Like our bird, our tree houses. Um, I don't know if you could at the moment you probably could build it in in, in washington or in canada um uh, but i don't think you could uh, build it at anywhere right because we are dealing here with a curved clp um which is yeah. a fantastic product uh but uh, not a lot of people are doing that so it's really new this kind of product um so we are we are keeping everything here in the region of where the material is sourced, where the trees are sourced, um, you know, like we build it more up, like where is all of our material coming? What kind of footprint does the material actually have? And build mm -hmm. there then a kind of a, um, a kind of a, not a cultural statement, but a, but a local uh, or a regional yeah. statement uh, uh, around that. Um, but uh, yes, I, I mean, I, I would agree. I, like it would be fantastic if you build a building uh, system that can adapt to different regions also based on their culture because a lot of this is actually lost uh, within this uh, last let's say um, like since Mies van der Rohe also right where everything mm. is uh, basically like uh, the international style of uh, of concrete boxes with uh, curtain wall facades and this yeah. makes our cities everywhere somehow look the same so to create a building system that leaves enough freedom um, for cultural differentiation um, and for regional aspects uh, would be a beautiful thing. And uh, yeah, it would be nice to think about something like that. That's, that's great. Yes. Thank you much for your answer, Chris. And, and thank you, Cody, for joining us. Okay. Chris, uh, unfortunately, we have 64 open questions, but obviously we do not have the time for that. And we do Next not. Next time, Riyadh. Um, so next time, hopefully, we'll have you again on another conversation and maybe give more room to questions. And um, I'd like to thank you so much for giving time to this. I appreciate all the uh, insight and uh, sort of the, uh, the, the mentorship that someone, that someone from the audience has, has put it, that you've given us today here on Live Academy. And thanks to the hundreds of people that joined us on Zoom Live and on YouTube Live. Um, you know, your participation from different places around the world has been so valuable. And uh, again, you know, a very exciting part of our journey. Chris, do you have any comments to say to end this uh, this talk today? Um, 
yeah i mean thanks guys for tuning in and uh, i think uh you know like as as architects um we we have a, a bit of more responsibility than than we might think we have um you know we are spearheading um, the biggest industry um on our globe the construction and the building industry and sometimes you know it feels that we as architects we somehow feel very comfortable within our bubble and some it seems that you know like we sit, sit in this kind of sand pit and throwing sand at each other uh, but the sand pit is on a beach and we don't see the opportunity outside of this sand pit mm. so um yeah sometimes to take a broader view um of 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 our lives and of, of our society lives i think uh, is a is a good way to go forward. Thanks again, Chris, and hope you enjoy your dinner. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs> I will. Thank you, guys.